Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 631 of the podcast and it is Friday the 1st of July 2022 as I record this. In today's show I'm talking to my editor Kristen Tate about editing fiction and non-fiction. We talk about the different types of editing, what AI tools are good for versus human editors, common issues in fiction and non-fiction and how to find and work with an editor. So that's coming up in the interview section. So not much happening in publishing and book marketing this week. It is the summer. (laughs) But in terms of useful stuff, last week, Claire McIntosh talked about the fact she needed to hire people eventually to help with her author business and her marketing. And the Alliance of Independent Authors blog this week has an article about when to outsource, what to outsource, how to set up systems, how to find assistance, what to do when things go wrong, and much more. It's really useful because basically at some point when you've been doing this for a while, you know you need more help and you're ready to pay for it. There's a difficult point for a while where you're not earning enough money to pay for any help, but you know you need to because you're just too overstretched. And so this is definitely a point that many of us face at some point. And uh, you can find that article on selfpublishingadvice.org links in the show notes about hiring virtual assistants. In my personal update, I am still recovering from a few days in London, where I spoke at the SPS, the self-publishing show live event. That's Mark Dawson and James Blatch and John Dyer and the team there. Uh, I spoke on the creator economy. Now, I always have a lot of anxiety. (laughs) If you've read my public speaking for authors, introverts, um, whatever it is, authors, creatives and other introverts, I talk about it in there. But yeah, I always, I still, after many, many years, what I've been speaking professionally for yeah almost 12 13 years and I still have huge anxiety before speaking upset tummy bad sleep and uh, just that wash of nerves beforehand and it was a big event there were sort of 700 people it's a big theater style uh, venue and there were quite a lot of technical problems during my talk, which not my fault. <laughs> so it was uh, definitely a difficult session, but seemed to go well. I got a lot of good feedback. So thank you to many of the listeners and my patrons who were there and said hi. And thank you so much for that. And it, the event was was great. There was lots of good information, lots of lovely people. And for some people, it was their first event sort of post-COVID. So a lot of people were happy to hang out with other authors and there's definitely so many benefits of going to physical or in-person events and meeting your buddies and uh, on the evening I had a bit of a dance with a lot of um, uh, a lot of authors having a dance it was it was very nice to a band that evening so yes that is done and I'm intending to put some of that session back into my full day event sessions and after my Shopify store is done after the launch of how to write a novel I will be recording the creator economy as a as a course so that'll be out in August sometime um actually doing the doing Mark's event helped me sort of recalibrate a lot of the material and reorganize it so I've got a a good framework for it but yes anyone who attended or if you got the digital pass that's just a, a brief overview but very exciting very exciting times to come. In the meantime, I am also recording the audiobook for how to write a novel and editing the audio files, which I'm sending off for mastering. I've done, got the hardback, the large print proofed, got the, uh, done the, the normal paperback, sorted all that out, but also setting up and testing my Shopify store. When you consider how many products I have multiplied by the number of formats, it is a hell of a setup. So I am aiming for a sort of minimum viable store at launch, but I want to get 
sort of a lot of the basics set up. So yeah, I'm looking forward to having it sorted out and so I can automate a lot more and have ads with precisely measurable return on investment. So yeah, quite excited about that. But lots of sorting things out. And if you go back and listen to the recent interview with Katie Cross, where we talked about it and you know, uh, there are there are set up things to do when you're running your own e-commerce store. But once it is set up, then it is much more under your control. So yes, just getting all that sorted. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments. Rashida sent a lovely note. She said, your interview with Claire McIntosh was everything my crime obsessed little heart could hope for. Game changers for me from this episode, reveals versus plot twists, tracking the reader's emotional journey as part of the plotting process, leaning into video marketing while protecting a beautifully messy personal life. I really needed that encouragement. Consider me mind blown and sent a lovely smiling picture from Durham in North Carolina out on a morning walk. Lovely smiling picture. Thank you, Rashida. And a couple more. Oh, question. Vicky Williams on the Katie Cross interview. She said, since you're opening a store on Shopify, are you closing your Payhip store? And so, yes, I will be closing. So no, I've been using Payhip for a while, uh, but only for ebooks and audiobooks. So I will indeed be closing that once I've got Shopify because Shopify will be ebooks, audiobooks, all the print books, workbooks, everything. So, yes, I'll be closing Payhip. But again, I mean, this is the nature of having an ongoing business. Originally, I just sold sort of downloadable PDFs from my website back in 20, whatever it was, 2009, I think I started selling direct. And I can't remember what I used back then, but I've used maybe five or six different services over the last um, 15 years. So yeah, it's you just you move on to things as they emerge. And Shopify is definitely the sort of biggest e-commerce thing I've done for sure. But I definitely, I recommend Payhip if you want a simpler version for, uh, I mean, they do allow print products, but it doesn't have print on demand, which is what uh, I love about this Shopify or WooCommerce solution is print on demand for, um, and drop shipping. So I don't have to send print people, print books to people, but I can still sell, sell them direct. Hell's Butterfly said about Claire's interview. Great show. I've been giving TikTok a try and loving it, but I totally agree with the idea that you don't have to use every platform. So you can tweet me at The Creative Pen, send me pictures of where you're listening, or email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com, or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So this episode is sponsored today by my own list of editors and proofreaders at thecreativepen.com forward slash editors. Do you need an editor or a proofreader? Do you need vetted services recommended by other indie authors? If you do, then check out my list where you can scroll through and look at different editors, different websites. You can see prices, you can request a sample edit and much more. And some of the editors on the list are uh, I'm an affiliate of, and it absolutely clearly says that. But then the rest of the list is from indie authors who've emailed me and recommended various people. So just go to thecreativepen.com forward slash editors for a list. And as ever, thank you so much to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. Welcome to new patrons, Nicole Bow, Elizabeth Main and Ryan Rivers. And thanks to all of you who've been supporting the show for months and years. You're all amazing. And you can support the show with just a few dollars or whatever your currency is. There's lots of currencies now. Just a coffee a month or whatever you like. And you'll get the extra monthly Q&A audio, which I do every month. And... Uh, you also get uh, money off my ebooks and audiobooks and courses. You can support the show at patreon.com, P A T R E O N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Kristen Tate is an editor and founder of The Blue Garrett, which offers editing services and advice for authors. She has a PhD in English from Columbia University, focusing on novels and publishing history. And she's the author of All the Words, A Year of Reading About Writing. Kristen is also my editor, mostly for fiction, but also for my recent How to Write a Novel book. So welcome to the show, Kristen. 
Thanks, Joanna. It's so great to be having a real life conversation with you, not just in the Microsoft Word comments. So I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> yeah, that is funny. And maybe we'll come back to this, but you and I have never spoken <laughs> before <No>. today, <laughs> which is brilliant. And of course, you know, introvert writers, introvert editors, right? I mean, why do we need yes. to speak? It's just not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> we communicate very well in those document comments. Exactly, in writing. But anyway, yes. before we get into that, tell us a bit more about you and why you chose to become an editor. Sure. So I think like it's the case for many of us, this was very much a winding path for me. Um, But when I look back and I follow all the threads, I can see that really what I was trying to do all along was find a job that would allow me to spend most of my time reading and thinking about words. So I, I, as you said, I have a PhD in English from Columbia and I thought at one point I was going to become an English professor. And I did love being a graduate student. And I really did get to spend the bulk of my time reading and thinking and also starting to teach, which I realized that I love doing too. But then there were a lot of other things about the academic life that didn't match up with the life I wanted to lead and how I wanted to spend my time. So at the point I I made the decision I was going to step away from academia, I also had to tiny human children and was spending a lot of time with them and gradually trying to to figure out other things to to find my next steps. So I knew I could write and I could edit and I started doing some freelance copywriting and copy editing. And I also did an internship with a wonderful local publisher here in San Francisco, uh, Chronicle Books, to see if publishing would be a good fit. And I I loved my time there, but also found that much like in academia, there was a lot of talking about books and meetings about books, but not a lot of time really sitting and working with words. So I realized that was not going to be the path for me and continued on with the the freelance copywriting and copy editing. And then in 2015, I worked with a a copywriting client on a business book he was self-publishing. And this was the first I had heard of any such thing. And that just opened up a whole new world for me. And I realized that this was something I could specialize in. So I started doing a lot of learning. That's about the time I found your podcast and just soaked it all in. And I went back and and did some more retraining and made sure that I had the skills I needed to work on both fiction and nonfiction. And then I've never looked back. Um, And now it feels like this is the thing I was always meant to do. I really do get to spend the bulk of my working day sitting quietly and as an introvert, reading books and thinking about words. And I'm thrilled that I found my, my place, my spot. I love that. I love that you identified the things you didn't want as well in the career. I think that's so important. I also want to say that you said you love teaching and we'll talk about how you do editing, but I love the little comments you leave for me sometimes. And I've talked openly on the show that I have some (laughs) blind spots and you put a little comment and you'll say, this is the reason I've made this change. And you, you try your best to educate me (laughs) in, in things that I just can't, I can't see it. And, and of course, I just love to know these little bits and bobs, even though I might not remember them. So I feel like you still do a bit of teaching. Also, you do still have courses, don't you? And you try and educate through your site. I do. Yeah. So that's a big part of what I do. And a lot of that is um, editing is expensive, right? And especially for folks starting out who don't have book sales to, to fund the editing of the next book, it's really important to me that some of this be accessible, right? So you get my teaching in the comments, but I share a lot of stuff on my website. There's a lot of blog posts there. I do have a, a course for that's specifically targeted for indie authors that's about the whole copy editing process and will kind of teach you everything that you don't know and might be worried about. So, and I do think as I've mentioned to you, I do teach, I try to teach in my edits. I try to explain what I'm doing, right? Because I think I, I want to demystify the process for, for authors. It can feel, it can feel scary to be handing over your, your labor of love to someone else and let them into your manus- manuscript. And so it's important to me for authors to know why I'm making the, the suggestions I'm making. Now, whether you remember it or not, is that that doesn't matter, right? So I really see myself, I'm the comma expert, right? Like <laughs> you don't have to be the comma expert. That's exactly why you're hiring me. So I think writers sometimes feel like 
they're supposed to know more than they do. And I, I really see authors, you are the idea specialist. You are the kind of creative person bringing these ideas to life through your words. And my job is just to, to make them better, to make sure they're clean and correct um, and to improve anything I, I can see could be improved, but it's definitely not a, it's not a kind of gotcha thing. Like, oh, Joanna, I told you about this comma and here you are using it again. Like that literally never crosses my mind. And I don't think it crosses the mind of, of other editors. We're really oriented towards, oh, here's a comma I can fix, right? Like here's a way <laughs> I can improve this. I love that. Uh, we really are helpers, you know? Yeah, help us. And that's exactly right. But of course, we're using the word editing. You've mentioned copy editing. I mean, we use this one word editing, but I feel like it's not one thing. And there are different phases, there are different types, and it depends on so many things. So can you just briefly outline the different types of editing, phases of editing, and what authors might expect? Yeah, absolutely. Let's break that down. I think that's another thing that many writers don't know going into the process and like everything else, like knowledge is power. So I really break this down into three stages. So first is content editing, which is sometimes also called developmental editing or structural editing. And not all writers and not all books need this step. But I think especially for newer writers, it can be a great way to get feedback on how the story is working and on things that you might not have seen in your work. So this is really a time for an editor to look at big picture issues, right? Does the plot hold together? Does your protagonist have a defined character arc? How is the pacing across the the course of a novel? And you can hire an editor for this, but you can also get feedback from critique groups or beta readers. It just might not be as thorough and they might not be able to tell you how to fix any problems they find. And an editor ideally will give you some ideas about how you might make changes to, to your manuscript. So, so that's content editing. That's stage one. And then second is copy editing. And really that's what we've been talking about so far. So this is really the polishing stage. And this is the one step that I think every author should try to hire a professional editor for if it's at all possible for you. So the goal at this stage is to end up with a manuscript that is correct, consistent, clear, and stylish, right? And those first three are really the heart of copy editing. It's about you know, making sure things like grammar and mechanics are correct, right? All those commas are where they are supposed to be. And, but it's also about making your book look like any other book a reader might pick up off their shelf, right? So traditional publishers use style guides. Here in the US, that means Chicago Manual of Style. In the UK, that's usually the New Oxford Style Manual. And those rules are, they're conventions and they're different from what you see in journalism or web copy. And they're small things, right? Like writing out numbers up to a hundred. A reader's not going to misunderstand it, but it sends a subtle cue that this book is slightly different from other books. And that's when I'm working with indie authors in particular, my goal absolutely is to make sure that their book looks indistinguishable from something that Herper Collins or another publisher is putting out. And then the last piece of that, that second stage is, is style, right? So once you've made sure all the mechanics and all of that are correct, spelling's right, you're left with style. And this is part of some editors call this line editing. I think of it really as part of copy editing, but this is where an editor is going to be thinking through every sentence and asking, can this be improved in any way, right? Would a different verb be more effective or what if the last clause came first? So that's, that's the second stage, that, that polishing stage. And then the last stage is proofreading. So at this point, one of the things I I always remind people I work with is is to really stop fussing with the book after the copy editing process. Because once you're in proofreading, you're really just trying to catch those final pesky typos or any tiny consistency errors. It's really a, a cleanup round. And it also means doing things like ordering a print proof and paging through it and looking at your ebook files in an e-reader or an app and making sure there aren't any, you know, sometimes a, a weird little line break or something will get in there. It's just doing all those final checks. So trying to be kind of a stand-in for the reader and making sure you catch any problems before it's your reader who's catching that. So those are the three stages, content, co- content editing, copy editing, and proofreading. 
And again, you don't need to pay for professional editing for all three of these stages for every book. That is the gold standard, but it's also, it's expensive, you know, as I've said. So you really need to think through your goals for the book that you're working on right now and what your overall budget for that book is. And then where you are as a writer in terms of experience and what kinds of outside resources like critique groups you might have access to. No, that's great. What a great overview. And yeah, I've used all different kinds at different stages. And I mean, you know, I'm a fan of editors. I think that a human editor is so important. And I say human because, of course, there's lots of tools now. I use Pro Writing Aid, there's Grammarly, there are more tools emerging all the time that can help authors with editing. And so I guess the question there is, why do we still need a human editor? And also, how can we use these tools in the best way to maybe help bring down the cost or at least get rid of some of the most basic issues in order that the edit, perhaps the human can focus on what humans do? Yeah. So this is such an interesting question. I think we are going to be thinking and talking about this um, for years to come, right? This is the future that is in front of us. And I, so I live in a household with a couple pretty serious computer geeks. And so we, this is dinner table conversation for us. So I tend to be maybe more open-minded than some other editors about how we can use these things. I do think that there are editors out there who are fearful of software and AI tools in the same way that, that some writers are fearful of them, right? I think the fear is that these things are going to eliminate our jobs. And I just don't see that happening, right? I really see these as tools that we can use to make our work as writers and editors, both both faster and better. And editors are already using some of these tools, right? I also use Pro Writing Aid as a check, especially, you know, I don't run it on your manuscripts because I know you do it. But for other clients, I, I will run that through because it does flag things that I could easily miss. Um, So I think it's good to talk about what what a program like that is good at and then what it misses. Mm. So it's excellent, obviously, at catching mechanical problems like missing punctuation or something like that. I think it's also really good at flagging things like cliched phrases and repetition and lack of sentence variety. And those are things that I often will catch them, but they they won't always rise to the surface for me, especially if one of those things pops up in a passage where I'm I'm really spending a lot of time fussing over a sentence. So I just like knowing that I don't need to think so much about cliches because pro writing aid is is going to flag those for me and then I can pass along that that feedback to a writer. So those are the good things about a program like that. I think it's important to note that they do sometimes get things wrong and I think this is especially important in fiction because there are so few absolute rules, right? Even comma rules, right, are a little bit bendier, I think, than many writers think. But, you know, one thing that I think pro writing aid is very good at flagging is is passive voice. And this is something that that we've talked about in the in our Mm. our comment conversations. I I have overcorrected and then you have (laughs) put them back. (laughs) Well, and that is, you know kind of demonstration of exactly why you need a human editor, right? And I I think the thing to know there is that sometimes you do, you really do need passive voice, right? There's a reason that we have this construction. So a good example might be a sentence like a red Maserati was parked in the driveway, right? So if I'm a character and I'm pulling up to my home and there's this uh, red Maserati I've never seen before parked in my driveway, I don't know who parked it there. And that's actually part of the mystery of the sentence, right? So that sentence really does need to be in passive voice because the important information there is the red Maserati and we've got it up front. So there are things like that that you that you don't want to change. And I, I think to take away, I think the fear around these tools is to remember that you as a writer are writing books for human readers, right? And you need a, a human editor to be a kind of stand-in for your readers. Like that's really one of my jobs. So I, I, when I'm editing, I think of myself first and foremost as a reader. So I'm paying attention to things like where am I confused or where does something seem slow? Where do I stumble over a sentence? 
And we might see an AI program kind of get to, to that level of nuance and analysis in our lifetimes, but we're definitely not there now. And I, I think too, that an AI is never going to be able to give the kind of personal warm feedback that a human editor can, can give. And that's part of what you're getting. Like you're hiring someone who's going to be, who's going to know your, your book almost as well as you do and can encourage you, right. And kind of remind you of the good things about it when you are stuck in that inevitable cycle of like, oh, this is all terrible. And I am so bored of with it. And I wanted to quit it. And I just don't, I don't think an, I, an AI is ever going to be able to provide that encouragement to keep going. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, like you said, it's, it's going to be a human reader. <laughs> So you need human perspective. And yeah, I yeah, absolutely. Everyone knows on this show that I'm positive about AI tools, but I absolutely want to use human editors and you particularly. So let's get into some of the common issues. So of course, one of the great things I feel about editors is you've read so many manuscripts. And even though as writers, we've read a lot of books, we, we read books that are finished. So we read the final product. So we never read those early manuscripts. Lots of people send me them, but I never read them because that's not what I do. I'm not an editor. But what are some of the most common issues you see in fiction in particular? Yeah, that's such a good point. And I think that's something to remember too, like, if you are an early stage writer, like, do you remember that you are seeing finished books? And many times those books have been worked on by editors, right? So you don't need to kind of be performing up to that level yet. And that's fine. So I think that's a really great point. So in terms of content editing, right? Like that first stage that we talked about, I would say the number one issue I, I talk about with writers is point of view. So for beginning writers, this often means deciding which character or characters is going to tell a story, making sure they aren't hopping from one character's point of view to another in a way that's going to confuse readers. And then for more experienced writers, what we're often doing is working on deepening point of view. So using various tricks like weaving in little glimpses of interiority, right? So like thoughts and feelings and memories into spots like dialogue exchanges or any other place we can kind of fit them in to, to add some extra texture or cutting out things, what are called filter words, right? So if you have a sentence like, I saw the leaves on the trees shiver in the breeze that I saw, you know, if you're deep in that, that first person narrator, narrator's perspective, the reader doesn't even need that I saw, right? They're going to understand intuitively that this is the, the narrator character seeing those leaves shivering. And then you can just cut that out and it, it moves the important verb in that sentence is the shivered, like, right, that's a great verb. And so we want to put it in the starring spot. So using tricks like that, and then the other really big issue I find many writers struggle with is the opening of a novel. And this is a hard balance to pull off, right? Because you want to get the story started, right? Because seeing a character in a scene and facing some kind of conflict, that's what's going to pull the reader in. But at the same time, you need to, to show the reader what this character is all about. And often that involves bringing in some backstory, right? And so I work with writers a lot about getting that balance correct at the beginning of the novel. I see a lot of manuscripts come into me with big, long prologue that's often about a really important event, right? Like maybe the kind of key backstory event of, of their main character's life. And that material absolutely has a place in the novel, but often that place is kind of woven woven in in different chunks over the early over the course of the early chapters so readers can really get invested in the live story that's that's happening so those are all content editing issues and then i would say from a, a copy editing standpoint the number one issue i spend time on is probably dialogue so i'm always thinking about does something sound like dialogue for this character is it in their voice and again this is another skill that i think writers develop over time. And it's a little bit hard to pull off, right? To find that balance between something that, you know, we're not trying to duplicate real speech, right? Because that would be full of misdirections and hesitations and ums and all of that. But we also don't want it to sound just like the narrative. And so finding that balance can be tricky. And so I spend a lot of time helping writers think about things like word usage and formality and informality and what's right for each character. And then I spend a lot of time on, on dialogue tags. So your dialogue tag is just that, you know, that little bit that identifies 
who says a sentence. So if you have a line like, give me back that book, Kristen said, the Kristen said is the the dialogue tag. And this is something I, I think we're going to talk about the revisions that you did for your first books in the Arcane series. And I know this is one thing that you focused on, and I think this is such a, a great tip. So a lot of those dialogue tags, you can actually convert into what's called an action tag. So you would give the dialogue line, give me back that book, and then add something like this. Kristen knew she'd never be able to find another copy just like this one, right? So it identifies the dialogue, the speaker of the dialogue line, but also adds like a little introspection, right? So we get a sense of what Kristen is thinking about this book and and why it's important to her. So it's a little bit of a, a two for one. So there are little tricks like that, that when I'm copy editing, I try to, to weave it into my edit. So they seem small, but they can actually be quite powerful. And this is another reason why we work with editors is because you're just blind to your own work and to have someone else's brain. And you're, that's basically what we're doing. We're hiring someone else's brain when you hire, hire an editor. That's how I think. And someone who is probably more obsessed, no, definitely more obsessed with words. <laughs> like I love words, right? I use words all the time, but I am not as obsessed with the the, I guess the rules like you and you mentioned the style and all of these things I my brain just doesn't think that way and I'm sure some writers do but I feel like this is a huge difference an editor's brain just sees all these things that I can't even see in my work right Yes, absolutely. And we're trained to do that, right? That is part of your training is to have that reflex uh, step in. And and again, as you said, as a writer, you're working on your own books, right? But I, I see, I read dozens of manuscripts every year, right? So I'm seeing different writers tackle these things in different ways and stumble across these problems in different ways. And so I, I just am more alert and able to pick them out. And I generally know what the solution is as well, as well, because I've helped another writer solve that. Mm, yeah, exactly. So let's just talk about nonfiction because you do also edit nonfiction as well, don't you? So what yeah. are some of the common issues with nonfiction? Yeah, it's actually quite different in a lot of ways. The copy editing is not so different, but when you're again, kind of stepping back to that, that first stage of content editing often. So for fiction, you know, a writer will generally come to me and they have their characters and their plot mapped out. And we don't think about nonfiction books having a plot, but really they do. And this is especially true if you think about creative nonfiction, like memoir and travel writing, writers have so much material, right? If it's based on your own experience, you have just this wealth of of stuff to draw on, right? So even if you're writing a book, say about a week long trip, just you can imagine how much you have to work with there. So for those kinds of books, I'm really working with the author on finding that kind of narrative spine, right? So you need to find a way to tell the story of the experience, right? And show how it shaped you and changed you, right? Just just like in a good novel, your protagonist is going to have a character arc. You want that in your creative nonfiction as well. And then for something more straightforward, like a a self-help book or an instructional book, it's about helping that author really zero in on their specific expertise and experience or on a concrete idea or, or argument. And I think this is something you really nailed for your forthcoming how to write a novel book, right? So this is a huge topic with lots of books on the subject. And you zeroed in on the discovery writer angle and also brought in a lot of experience about about writing for audio, which we all need to be thinking about. And I think finding that angle was very smart, right? Because most writing craft books assume that writers are advanced planners when that doesn't work for everyone. So that's a great example of you zeroed in on that, um, that specific hook for your nonfiction book. And then I would say beyond the kind of plot of the book, I, I for nonfiction, I, I'm paying a lot of attention to structure and organization. I always pull out the whole outline and look at that separately and holistically. And there, again, I'm trying to put myself in the place of the reader, right? Is the reader going to get confused at any point, right? Are these sections in the right order? Maybe there's something that's later in the book that actually would be more beneficial if it came earlier. So I'm really trying to step back and think about those things. And then then I think as a copy editor standpoint, I also look for opportunities to, to add internal references and links back to different places in the book. So this is a great example of something that someone who's 
spent months writing a nonfiction book is not going to be able to to see those connections always. But I'm I'm reading through the whole book in a short window of time, usually like a week or two weeks. And so I have a chance to hold the whole book in my mind and I can see a place where, okay, well, you talked about point of view in chapter 12 and there's a short discussion in, in chapter five. So we should also mention that there's going to be a longer discussion in, in chapter 12. And um, many times an author is just not going to see that opportunity at all. But it, it's just, those are great signposts for readers. No, brilliant. And yes, I mean, I treat you as like a first reader as well, because some people use beta readers, some people have other writer friends or whatever who read their book first and, and give other feedback like that. But I don't use writing groups. And so I do a lot of self-editing, but then you're also seeing it, like you said there, you're seeing it as the whole thing you're seeing the whole book and so whether it hangs together again I guess this goes back to the what's human what's human about the editing and is how does this thing hang together and progress in your mind from beginning to end whatever type of book it is it's a journey for the reader absolutely the thing that the editor can do that the writer can no longer do is we can see it fresh right? I approach it, especially if I'm, if this is my first read, I've obviously never stepped into the manuscript before. And I think you're hiring someone to get that fresh pair of eyes that you just cannot have yourself any longer. Mm, absolutely. All right. So let's just also talk about rewriting older books because the first books we've worked on together are my first three thrillers, which you edited these 2022 editions of Stone of Fire, Crypt of Bone and Ark of Blood. And it was 10 years after I first published them and had learned a lot. And yeah, I learned a lot, but you still did a blooming good edit on them as well. So I feel like this kind of rewriting, I'm really happy I did it. I'm really happy we went through that process, but I also know that it's a big deal for people. So when should people consider rewriting, re-editing and what should they watch out for? Yeah, great question. So I think it really depends on your overall goals for your author career and then where those books that you're considering rewriting or re-editing fit into the picture. So if it's an early standalone novel, then I would likely leave it alone, right? I think Readers do understand that you learn and evolve as a writer and someone who is a super fan might go back and find that much earlier book. And even if your craft isn't at the level that it is with later books, they can still enjoy it because they can see the seeds of where you're going or have a chance to see you tackling a a theme that you often return to in a different way in an early book. So I think unless you have a lot of very low reviews or comments about things like grammar mistakes, I just leave that be. And and I would say the same if if you have a, a limited series, something that's just three or four books and then you're done. So I think rather than going back and, and re-editing and revising that, I'd focus on putting the financial and time resources into the next series and making that as good as it can be. Now, where I do think it makes sense is if you have a, a long running series that is the centerpiece for your author brand as Arcane is for yours. So if this is a series that's going to run for many, many future books. And especially if you're going to be investing advertising dollars into getting folks to start with the first book, then it might make sense to work with an editor on that first book or to do your own kind of revision of that to make sure that your advertising investment is going to pay off. And here I'd really look at the numbers, right? I think authors have such, um, there are so many emotions around your books and that makes absolute sense. But if you can decide some of these things just really based on the numbers, and I, I think here I'd look at, at your read through, right? So if you are seeing a lot of people reading book one and then there's a big drop off for book two, that might be a sign that some additional work could be helpful. And then in terms of how to approach this, I would encourage folks to, to start with some research research, right? So you might read a couple of advanced writing craft books, even if you feel like you've done that work in the past, find some new ones, you're always going to learn some new tips. And then I would also really sit down and read very closely and carefully and with a pencil or highlighting in your Kindle, some recent popular books in your genre and really be looking for those things. I mean, just like the dialogue tags we just talked about, look for technical things that you can see these writers doing and make a list of of those things. And then go back to your novels and see if you can find places where you can apply those. And obviously, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to change your character arcs or your 
your plot or anything like that, right? You don't want to make those books unfamiliar to readers who have already read them and have an attachment to them, but you're just trying to elevate them a little bit. I have a client who used the term upwriting for this kind of work, and I really love it. I think it's a good term. You're looking for opportunities to make what's already on the page better. Mm, Upwriting. That is, that's a good one. I like that. Isn't that great? Yeah. 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 That's excellent. Okay. So we've talked a lot about craft, but I also think working relationships are just so important. And I was thinking back and you did some checking of, I think my Valley of Dry Bones years ago. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah. About San Francisco. And at the time, and I think you're in the acknowledgements of that book is checking that bit about San Francisco. Like it literally wasn't an edit thing. It was more like a sort of a local beta reader or something. Yeah, and then, exactly. Yeah. And then when my previous editor moved on and inevitably people move into other things and I was like, I really need a new editor. And I remembered our conversation and then we connected by email and social media. And so I feel like in that way, I was aware of you. And then, but then obviously when we were like, oh, are you available? And then we looked at a contract and we were like, well, I'm not sure if this is going to work for me. And you were like, yeah, let's just see what happens because it felt like we were doing the project to see if we could actually work together. And I'm just so happy with our editorial relationship. And you really match what I'm looking for at my stage of my writing career, both for my writing and personality wise. And so I, but I totally get that everyone wants different things. So how can authors find an editor who matches with them for their book, for the time of their career, for their personality? Yeah, that's a really good question. And first of all, thank you, right? Like this, that's an editor's dream always is to hear, oh, you are a great match for me and that people appreciate your work. So that's so lovely to hear. But I think the personality thing is is a really big deal. And again, this comes back to we're humans, right? And so I think so much of it is about communication style, right? That's one thing I always advise folks who are looking for an editor to to pay a lot of attention to. So if you're the kind of person who only wants to communicate over or email, make sure that that's what your that's what your editor does. Or if you're someone who wants to get on a Zoom call to go over the feedback or kick around ideas after you've gotten a content edit back, again, make sure you're working with an editor who is is happy to do that. So it's it's about that. And then I think it's also about how do you like to receive feedback, right? So again, do some kind of self reflection and think about your favorite teachers. Again, editing is closely related to teaching, and think about how you. Like like to receive feedback, right? So some folks want an editor who is just super direct, who makes the changes right in their manuscript, maybe doesn't do a whole lot of explanation and it's just very straightforward. And I, I'm a little, as you know, I'm a little more talky in my editing. I leave a lot of comments and I give a lot of explanations all of which take more time for you also to work through. And it takes more time for me to do, which makes me a little bit more expensive, but that's just how I do things. And I I think as an author looking for an editor, and especially if you're looking for someone who's going to be with you through several books, I think it's really worth taking your time with that process. So many editors offer a sample edit, and that's kind of what we did with those first thrillers. Really, we agreed we were going to work together on those few books and then see where we were. But a A sample edit is a great way to to get a feel for exactly the way an editor is going to treat your words and exactly the kind of comments you're going to get and all of that. So take the time to to talk to a few people and rely on your on your intuition here, right? It's okay to go with your gut. I think that's going to lead you to a, a the better fit. Yeah. And a lot of people email me because I have a list of editors, thecreativepen.com forward slash editors. And of course you're on that list and there are lots of other people on that list. And people always email me and say, Hey, you've got a big list, but can you just recommend someone who would be the right editor for me? (laughs) And I'm like, no, I can't. I literally can't do that. Right. It's, it's like dating. Everyone's got a different match. Yeah. As that is the correct analogy. And I think it's important. And I would say, you know, your list is really great. I would also say another good place to to look is there are a lot of editing organizations. So here in the US, there's the Editorial Freelancers Association. In the UK, there's the Chartered Institute of Editors and Proofreaders, and they have directories. They also have a job list. So you can, you know, kind of talk a little bit about your book and you'll get literally dozens of editors emailing you if they think that they're going to be a good fit. So 
there are a lot of folks out there. You have a lot of choice. So take the time and do some research, look at people's websites, look at what how they conduct themselves on social media and find someone who you just feel like you vibe with, right? Like that's, mm. <laughs> that's a the good way to do it. Yeah. And trust is such a big deal. Actually, let's just answer this question because people do ask it as new writers with trust. People say, if I send my manuscript to an editor, what if they steal it or publish it or other things? So how do you answer it when people worry about that trust issue of actually sending a manuscript? Oh, yeah. No, I get that question all the time. So I I think First, there are a couple of practical answers, right? So you don't have to, to register your copyright in a work in order for you to have copyright over it. And once it's in a fixed form, which means wherever it is, like on a legal pad or in a Microsoft Word document, you have copyright. So it, it actually would be illegal for me to, to do that. And then just in a practical sense, like <laughs> I think writers, when they're just starting out, they don't realize just how heavy a lift it is to put a book out there and actually sell it, right? So I just, it wouldn't, it doesn't make any sense for me to spend the time yeah. doing that, all right? And in a practical sense, so I use a contract with everyone, right? We, mm. you referred mm-hmm. to that. And the contract specifies that, you know, that this is your work and it actually also assigns the copyright of any edits I make to the writer. So that's, that's something to pay attention to. So do, you know, do work with an editor who uses a contract and read that contract. And if there's something that you want to have added or changed, ask for that change. And most folks are are willing to do that. So we do understand it's not just even about the, you know, are you going to seal my manuscript? I, I think it's, it's a vulnerable thing to send a piece of writing to someone to have them evaluate it. And I think we do know that as editors and take that, that trust seriously and try to, to, to honor and respect that, that leap of faith that writers are making. Absolutely. And then also a good business relationship goes both ways. And basically, as soon as you invoice me, I pay it. I'm like, I want to pay you. <laughs> it is amazing how fast it is. Like sometimes less than a minute goes by. and I, that, that I'm just hits. waiting to pay you. But no, to me, this is really important. I do this with my book cover designer. I do this with any people I value in my business, I need to pay. And I think this is a really important thing. And you've mentioned expensive, but it's about value to me. And that's what I'm paying for. I'm paying for your brain and it's valuable. And so, but of course it goes both ways because you only have one brain and so you (laughs) you can't just help everybody. So it's also important for you to have a sustainable business. So how do you make sure you get the right clients and who are your ideal clients in case people listening inundate you? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that's a great question. So for me, it's really about building those long-term relationships. And I love working with clients on on multiple books. So I love people who are writing series. I think for me, the the key thing is I love working with writers who really want to, to do the work, right? Who are ready to geek out with me about a detail like, this week I'm, I'm working with a fantasy author and we're going back and forth about, are we going to capitalize the term lore keepers, right? And she's she is just invested as invested in this as I am. And we've talked about, okay, well, what else have we capitalized across the course of these novels and how does this suit? And so I, I really love people who want to, to really think in that deep and very detailed way about their books. And then especially for, I love working with newer writers, but I especially like newer writers who understand that, you know, likely their first book is going to need a substantial amount of work and that's okay, right? It's, that's a very usual, normal thing, but also I want to work with folks who are prepared to, to do it, right? So it's heartbreaking for me to spend a lot of time on a manuscript evaluation and send it off. And then the writer just is overwhelmed and puts it in a drawer. So I do spend a lot of time to try to build in kind of touch points. And I go back and talk to people and try to to give the kind of constructive feedback in a manuscript evaluation that will help them take those next steps. And I also recognize that's hard. So that's something I I like people to understand. And then I also love working with more experienced writers like yourself, because it challenges me to to dig a little bit deeper, right? To, to, I have to look harder, you know, there's always the commas, right? But if I'm working on a manuscript that's technically very clean, right? I, I have to challenge myself to, to look a little bit harder to find improvements. And that, that helps me challenge myself and keep learning advanced skills and keep learning and studying and thinking. And that's really kind of all my, all my favorite things. 
Oh, fantastic. Right. So tell us what you have for writers over at uh, Blue Garrett and where people can find you online. So yes, everything is on my website. So that's the Blue Garrett with two R's and one T, which I, I spend a lot of time saying that just like your creative pen with two N's, but I, I love the name and have a personal connection with it. So it's worth it. So everything really is there. Um, the biggest thing I do every week, I, I send a weekly newsletter that usually has a very in-depth piece about uh writing craft. Right now I'm doing a series where I've picked one bestseller a month and I'm analyzing it in very, very granular detail to, to pull out techniques that, that writers can take away and try out with their own writing. And as, as you know, we talked about before, I also have a a short class for indie authors about how to find an editor and how to work with someone and like, what does the copy editing process look like? So if you're feeling overwhelmed by that process or just don't feel like you don't have a good grasp of what it is. This course has a lot of good videos and visuals and will really walk you through the the process of finding an editor who will be a good fit for you. And then in addition to my website, you can find me on Twitter at Kristen Tate SF as in San Francisco. And then I'm also on Instagram at Blue Garrett. Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time, Kristen. That was great. I loved it. So I hope you found the interview with Kristen interesting and that it helped you understand how the editing process can work, as well as some tips for what to watch out for in your book. So How to Write a Novel has a lot more on editing and that will be coming out in the next few weeks. Coming later this week, I have an in between episode on self-publishing special print editions with John Bond and Chris Wold from White Fox. It's mainly around the special print runs that many authors are doing for Kickstarter. And I worked through my Kickstarter project plan with John before I decided to spend the same amount of time on building a Shopify store instead of doing a Kickstarter for this book. Although I'm still interested in doing one at some point. And they are a great print partner. So I wanted to talk to them in case you're you're interested in various details uh, you need to know for doing these special print projects, which I think more and more of us are doing now because we understand that people want that lovely, um, just a, that lovely object as well as the information or the story. And in next Monday's episode, I'm talking to Tess Gerritsen about writing for the long term, how she rejuvenates her creativity, writing a series, writing medical thrillers and much more. I was thrilled to talk to such a wonderful writer and she also has such positive things to say about going indie. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.